Every now and then, I come across a story about a miracle that consumes my thoughts, a story so thought-provoking that it challenges my convictions. Perhaps miracles do happen every day, and there is truth to their positive impact after all. Today, I'll share one such miracle, and then I'll tell you my thoughts and conclusions as a non-believer. Stick around till the video ends for a live stream where viewers can call in or comment their thoughts. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to interact with this video and subscribe if you would like to see more. Thanks for being here. This is a true story about a Muslim who was persecuted for his faith and stood his ground anyway. For the sake of anonymity, let's call him Fadi. Fadi was unapologetically Muslim. He was a psychiatrist and an author, and a peaceful, productive member of his community who hoped to improve the lives of the troubled people around him. He was pondering a way to make sense of the hardships of life and his goal was to write a book about this topic and publish it in hopes of sharing his conclusions with those who needed them. But in an ironic twist of fate, his life was about to become filled to the brim with hardship. Fadi's country was torn apart by a military force supportive of a fascist regime. They were cracking down on religious groups, and in this case, Muslims were the primary target. He was among the people lucky enough to have a chance to escape. You see, Fadi had a visa that would allow him entry into the United States. He sensed the impending doom and wasn't sure whether he should leave or not, mostly because he knew that he could not take his family with him. He felt a sense of responsibility towards his parents and had to assess his priorities. Should he immigrate and save himself, or stay and try to protect his parents? On one hand, immigrating would give him a chance to write his book and hopefully help alleviate the suffering of many people. On the other hand, staying probably wouldn't do much to prevent the inevitable capture and execution of his family. He went to the masjid to pray as if it were his last prayer, or at least his last prayer in a mosque. He prayed sunnah, then he prayed istikhara to ask Allah for help. Then he sat down with the Qur'an till it was time for the iqamah. As he opened the mushaf, he couldn't help but notice and fixate on one part of this verse from Surah An-Nisa. Could this be a coincidence? Of all the pages he could have landed on, and of all the words he could have noticed at a glance, three were practically shining a light right into his eyes. Ihsana. Paraphrased, it means, be good to your parents. There was no way for Fadi to interpret this as a coincidence. This was clearly the sign he had been asking for, so he saw no choice but the obvious, to stay with his family. Fadi was eventually captured by the fascists and sent to an inhumane prison where his survival was uncertain. His story was one of turmoil and pain and his days were filled with manual labor and starvation and disease. I cannot tell you the graphic details since they would take a mental toll on most people. As those around him were losing hope in the face of torture and death, against all odds Fadi persevered. He had his weak moments, of course, but ultimately, he didn't lose hope in surviving. He took in all the suffering and tried to make sense of it. He continued writing down his thoughts on a few pieces of paper he managed to find, and he stashed them in his pocket. Those pages became not only symbolic of his resilience, but an actual, tangible source of hope. Islam, on the other hand, was not his main source of hope anymore. He may have still believed in Allah, but he was confused about why Allah would allow the senseless suffering of his worshippers. But rather than dwelling on that internal conflict, he focused on observing his own thoughts and observing the prisoners around him, hoping to use this experience to make his book a reality. He survived the prison for three grueling years as he watched those around him lose all hope and faith and consequently die. But not him. He was a man on a mission. But in another cruel, ironic twist of fate, Fadi's mission was about to be sabotaged. He was being moved from one prison to another when he was ordered to strip down and put on clothes that belonged to a recently executed prisoner. He had no time or opportunity to hide his papers, so he took whatever relief he could get by touching them one last time before he surrendered his coat. 
Given how rapidly his health was declining, he predicted that he could not remember and rewrite everything all over again. All of his hard work and his anchor of hope were lost forever, with nothing to replace them. But Fadi was wrong. When he put on the clothes he was given, he instinctively reached into his pockets, searching for that comfort. The dread and disappointment filled him until he felt a familiar texture at the bottom of a deep pocket. There was a paper. His heart fluttered. There was no way that this was one of the pages from his book. Perhaps a blank piece of paper he could use to start writing again, or maybe it was just a food wrapper. His mind kept racing and racing until he finally got a chance to hide and yank the paper out to look at it. He was shocked. It took him a moment to process what he was reading. It seemed to be a page from a mushaf and it was heavily damaged. But despite the wear and tear on the page, he was able to read one verse from Surah Al-Ahqaf. فاصبر كما صبر أولو العزب من الرسل ولا تستعجل لهم كأنهم يوم يرون ما يوعدون لم يلبثوا إلا ساعة من نهار بلاغ فهل يهلك إلا القوم الفاسقون So O Prophet observe patience as the resolute messengers observe patience and be not in haste about them the day they will see what they are promised it will be as if they did not stay in the world more than an hour in a single day. This is a message, so none will be destroyed except the sinners. His eyes welled up with tears and he fell to his knees. This was clearly Allah's way of reaching out to him. The Lord of the universe noticed him, such an insignificant little human, and validated his suffering and gave him an endless well of hope how should he have interpreted such a coincidence other than a reminder to pray to Allah and find the answer to his book, the meaning of suffering, but in Islam? His life changed completely when he realized that he was trusting his intellect and his observations far more than his blind, unwavering faith in Allah. He felt shame and guilt for ever doubting Allah's wisdom. He was now convinced that part of the reason his people were being punished is that Allah is testing them, and that is mercy. He is testing them to wash away their sins because the Ummah has been lacking in faith and adherence to prayer. It was also a reminder of the infinitely worse torture in the afterlife if he does not worship Allah to the fullest extent that Allah deserves and demands. Fadi felt responsible for his suffering and sought to do everything he could to earn Allah's mercy. Despite the risk, he started secretly organizing halaqat or religious gatherings where the men could revise and recollect as much of the Quran as they could. Before he knew it, he was rising through the ranks among the prisoners while giving them a goal to live for, worshipping Allah before they possibly die and face a more horrendous eternal fate. He eventually survived the prison and was freed when the fascists were defeated. That one verse crumpled in the pocket of his coat didn't just save him from hopelessness and death, but it set him on a path to gain faith, knowledge, and leadership skills that made him a very influential preacher and a political figure. He wrote many books and his words reached far, way further than they ever would have reached had the focus of his book not been Islam. His incredible story demonstrated that there was something else out there that before we continue further, I want you to take a moment to acknowledge your thoughts and emotions. How did you feel when you listened to the story? Did you feel touched or moved? Were you happy to hear how Allah supported Fadi even though he didn't recognize it at first? How has this story affected your faith? Were you suspicious of the story because you were inclined not to believe religious stories about coincidences, or more specifically, coincidences that are labeled miracles? You can pause the video if you need a moment to mull it over. Now let's rewind a little. No, further back. A bit further. This is a true story about a Muslim right there. I lied. This is based on a true story, but it's not about a Muslim. It's about a Jewish man called Viktor Frankl. I'm sorry if you feel betrayed by my narration. Rest assured that I will never lie to you and leave it at that. So I hope that you listen to my clarification and analysis. 
it is more important than the first portion of this video. Let me tell you the original story. Viktor Frankl was a neurologist, psychiatrist, and a philosopher who recalled a very similar incident in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Austria had been occupied by the Nazis, and Viktor did have a chance to escape because of his American visa. He was conflicted about leaving his parents behind, and though he did not pray as Tehara, he did experience a coincidence that some might call a miracle. He noticed a piece of marble his father kept from the site of a destroyed synagogue, with an engraving on it that just happened to be about one of the commandments. It said, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land. How much more of a cliché could this be? This is textbook religious miracle right there. And Victor did go through a lot of hardship in the concentration camps for three long years. His days were indeed filled with manual labor, starvation, and disease. He was also writing down his thoughts, which he later used to write that very book. And the part of the story about having to change clothes and losing his manuscript is also true. Instead of a page from the Quran, he found a page from a Hebrew prayer book containing the most important Jewish prayer called Shema Israel. That coincidence gave him the push that he needed to continue living, and may have saved him from giving up and dying. This ordeal in the concentration camps helped him contribute greatly to the fields of philosophy and logotherapy. He's actually the one who developed logotherapy. His work has influenced countless people throughout the years, and it's hard to say whether any of that would have happened had he left Austria before he was captured, or had he simply lost his manuscript of his book and found no papers in his pocket at all. Now, I want you to take another moment to acknowledge your thoughts and emotions after hearing the real story. Are you suspicious or skeptical about any of this happening at all? Do you feel annoyed or irritated, not just about being lied to, but you're not sure why? How has this affected your faith? Are you now curious about Judaism because you have a suspicion it might be the one true religion, based on this miracle? Ideally, you should be feeling and thinking the same things after hearing both stories, except the religions would be switched. If you were suspicious of the first story, you should be suspicious of the second story. If you felt more validated in your belief in Allah, you should now feel more justified to believe in Yahweh instead. If you regard stories like these to be evidence for your preconceived belief, but not another one, perhaps it's just confirmation bias. Of course, none of us are free from bias, but now can be a great opportunity to recognize that bias and account for it in the future. I myself am guilty of not immediately noticing my bias. When I came across the story in the book, I did not recoil and think, yeah, BS that happened. I mean, I glossed over it, and I didn't think there was anything supernatural about it either, but had this been a story by a Muslim author, I know for a fact that I would reflexively be suspicious that these coincidences happened at all. And I am jaded, and I have plenty of justification for that heightened skepticism. In my youth, I've been told many fabricated stories by sheikhs and teachers about so-called miracles that happened to them or somebody they know, only to hear the stories retold differently to other kids a couple of years later. I've fallen for so many exaggerated or unproven religious tales before, but I didn't treat Victor's story with the same degree of suspicion. And that's okay, as long as I'm aware of it and I adjust for it when necessary, and as long as I'm not letting him use these stories to prove anything. I should indeed doubt whether this actually happened to Victor, but I was less concerned about the truth of his coincidences because he doesn't use them to make any religious claims. He doesn't use them as some sort of proof or evidence that Yahweh is out there, like many preachers would do. Whether this happened or not doesn't change my takeaways from that book. But the funny thing is, because I did my due diligence now, I found out that he may have intentionally or unintentionally exaggerated how much time he spent at one of the camps, so make of that what you will. For now, let's presume that these events did happen to Victor. What I found to be noteworthy about the first incident is how easily a coincidence can influence our choices. If Victor didn't come across that commandment, maybe he would have left Austria. If he was less religious, maybe he would have ignored this sign completely. But these factors, combined with him being unsure about what to do, made his choice almost inevitable once he saw that commandment. His rational mind was stuck between two paths, and the decision-maker was in an external event that he may have assumed was a hint from God. So how free was his choice, really? Just something to think about. His reaction to the second event was even more interesting. 
Rather than interpreting the page of the Jewish prayer as God saying, have faith in me and I will save you, he took it as a reminder to live his thoughts rather than worry so much about putting them on paper. Had Victor been more religious, he could have been more likely to just turn to prayer every single day and wait for salvation or death. His way of making meaning or sense of that coincidence was not one that I expected at all. I urge you to think about how your perspective affects your conclusions about these uh, miracles. Different people can take the same coincidence to mean different things. If it's a sign from God, which God? What does this sign actually mean? If it's not a sign from God, did it bring to your attention a, a subconscious thought that you already had? Try to assess these miracles from an outsider's perspective. Think about the miracles you accept with the same scrutiny and skepticism you give to the miracles that you reject. In both stories, the protagonist's belief in God gave them hope. So isn't that a good thing? Regardless of whether Yahweh is real or Allah is real or neither, that hope was real and it did have a positive effect on their lives. It may have been what kept them alive. But Victor's story should demonstrate to a Muslim that the hope derived from miracles or beliefs is psychological and not actually tied to the truthfulness of the religion. I don't intend to rob you of your religious hope, but I am reminding you to not confuse bias and comfort with evidence. Do not build your faith in a whole religion and everything that comes with it on such a shaky foundation because you seek a bit of hope. So if I don't necessarily want to burst your bubble of hope, why am I poking at it? Because blind faith puts you in a vulnerable position that might make you worse off. Here's an example. I intentionally chose this verse to be Fadi's trigger. When I said that he noticed these three words, إحسانة, instead of the rest of the page, you may have thought, wow, this is evidence that it's no coincidence. What are the chances? Actually, let's calculate the chances. There are 600 pages in the Quran, roughly, or 300 double page views. A 50% chance he'd look at the left page first, 15 lines per page. So a very rough estimate would say that he had a 0.0056% chance that he would randomly land on this specific line, and you obviously start on the right side. That is incredible, especially given how he had just asked Allah for help before opening the Qur'an. But let's flip this number over. This means that for every 18,182 people who opened the Qur'an, a similar thing would have happened. I keep being reminded of how there are 1.8 billion Muslims on earth. If only 18,000 of them prayed istikhara then opened the Qur'an, statistically, one could land on a line of a verse that relates to a thought that they were having. That's not even taking into account other factors, like how multiple verses could convey the same meaning, therefore raising the chances of this coincidence, or how one could find the verse after some reading and it would still be thought of as a miracle. But you get the point. While you were distracted with the implausibility of this miracle, or if you don't understand Arabic, you may have missed the part of the verse that mentions concubines or sex slaves. Fadi himself would not have noticed that in another verse in this chapter, it explicitly mentions concubines again, and it was revealed in awful circumstances. Asbab and Nazul don't really absolve it. Or that only two verses earlier in this chapter is the infamous verse that infantilizes women and puts men in a dominant position and justifies domestic violence, lightly. Fadi may not have paid much attention to any of that, but after his return from the prisons, after he gained unwavering faith that Allah's words are true, he's unlikely to object to any of it. There's a chance Fadi could have become a harmless preacher of a progressive interpretation, but if he's full of faith that was solidified by difficult circumstances, it's likely that he'd be obsessive about Islam and would try to obey every word as close to the literal interpretation as possible, no matter how problematic. It seems less risky. I can think of at least one popular preacher who went from personal tragedy to fundamentalism and extremism because he found relief in Islam, or religion in general. We humans are excellent at pattern recognition without even realizing it. Many of us can imagine a rabbit drawn by the craters of the moon. Some people noticed this face from an image of Mars taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. Many scientists hypothesize that this pattern recognition is an evolutionary trait that helped humans survive. The quicker you can spot a face in the bushes, the sooner you can run away from the wild beast. But it's not just about visual patterns. We learn through pattern recognition. 
Given enough time and trial and error, a child will figure out which shapes and holes fit together. And before having the equipment to measure and predict the weather, many cultures were able to recognize patterns in cloud formation, temperature, and humidity to predict storms and rainfall. Pattern recognition is such a powerful tool, but it can also be a deceptive trap. Since Fadi built his blind faith on this miracle that he experienced, his confirmation bias, along with pattern recognition, might heavily influence how he reads the Qur'an or interprets Islam in general. Take Fadi's first miracle, for example. He followed Allah's command in the verse to be good to his parents, which led him to his experience in prison, which led him to his success as a religious leader. Allah did not let him down, he thought, so that is a pattern he now recognizes. In the verse that gave him hope, Allah commands him to be patient, none will be destroyed except the sinners, and in other translations, the defiantly disobedient, or the immoral, or those who transgress, or the evil. It's kind of vague, you get the point. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was patient and he endured, and the transgressors were eventually destroyed. And once Fadi is trained on this pattern and gets to the point of blind faith, that last step in the pattern is not even necessary. He will read a command and using confirmation bias, he'll relate it to an anecdote, experience, or some story propagated in pop culture. He won't need to think about whether this command is sensible. He will obey and feel assured that the outcome Allah promised will happen in this life or the next one. Now that Fadi is overzealous and undercritical, this pattern becomes a dangerous trap. Since that verse was proven true to him already, the disobedient people were indeed destroyed, why shouldn't he have a negative attitude towards all disobedient people, not just occupying forces? In a similar vein, if Allah had a hidden wisdom by bringing his attention to the verse that says, be good to your parents, Allah must have a hidden wisdom in his prescription of wife-beating in the same chapter. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted and great, all the time, unquestionably. Finding hope in a coincidence is not a problem in and of itself, but your susceptibility to ad hoc rationalizations is a potential problem. I mean how likely you are to give something an implied or intended meaning after it already happened. If it's necessary to adopt a whole belief system to make sense of a coincidence or call it a miracle, then you're not doing your due diligence. You don't know what you're signing up for now or in the future. In this story, the way that Victor derived meaning and hope from his coincidence is a lot more focused than Fadi. Religion was indeed a useful source of hope, and it was relatively harmless for him. But that's a counterintuitive exception, because Victor didn't focus too much on the religious side of the coincidence. He didn't take it as a sign to drop what he was doing and obsessively obey God. Maybe because his religion didn't threaten him with reminders of hell on every page of the holy book. Let's set aside the part of the story where Fadi becomes an influential preacher. Say he interpreted the miracle the same way but wasn't in a position to influence anyone. Fadi was still harming himself with his newfound faith. Sure, he became more motivated to live, but at what cost? He felt like he deserved the torture that he received because he was primed to feel guilt for his shortcomings as a worshipper. He associated suffering with mercy because he rationalized it as washing away his sins. On one hand, it did help him survive suffering, but on the other hand, he survived with feelings of guilt, responsibility, and fear that will never die. He can only quiet those feelings down through servitude to Allah and worship, but that is temporary. He will always owe his life to Allah for saving him, let alone creating him, and he will always think of the torture of Allah that he experienced just a fraction of, a very minuscule version of, in prison. The worshipping never ends. It's a masochistic struggle that will not end until Fadi dies and receives his book of deeds in his right hand and enters paradise. He replaces his temporary struggle in prison with one that follows him to the grave. Every missed prayer, every delayed prayer even, will feel like a huge crime that he deserves punishment for. So was his life really meaningful if he traded his fear and submissiveness to a fascist regime for fear and submissiveness to a fascist god? Some of this may seem far-fetched to you, but it really isn't. Most pious Muslims have either felt these feelings or witnessed how other people, like their loved ones, cry when they pray. That is a lot less likely to happen if you don't understand the words you're reciting, so I anticipate that some of the English-speaking audience might not relate. But anyway, those pious Muslims describe this state of mind as khushua, submissiveness and humility in front of Allah. 
They might cry and wail at the verses or dua about Allah's torture. That is no coincidence. And if fear, guilt-tripping, and emotional blackmail is the price to pay for hope, I am certain that there are better ways to find hope. Religion can remain a source of hope if it is sanitized and stripped of those precursors to harm. My gripe or my protest has never been purely about the belief in the occult, meaning the supernatural or mystical or magical beliefs. I don't care if you think an angel is in charge of the rain, even though you understand the physics behind it. I don't care if you think some god created us from Adam and Eve while you simultaneously acknowledge the mechanisms behind evolution. I care if your beliefs are loaded with things you're not even aware of and are imposed on others, legally or otherwise. I don't care if you think that God sent you personally a sign that gave you hope and meaning. I care if you use that kind of story to tug on people's heartstrings to influence them into adopting your entire belief system. I care if you use it to lower the standards for evidence or proof, and then hypocritically demand the real evidence from others. I focused on Islam today, but other religions are not off the hook. This was not a commentary on Judaism either. I'm not painting Judaism in a favorable light or saying that I completely believe Victor's accounts of his experience. I'm using this story as an example. Things could have gone very differently. For example, Victor could have been jaded by his experience and dug deep into fundamentalist ideology and joined the ranks of an extremist group. The individual experiences will vary in each belief system and across them all. But the more totalitarian a religion is, the more scare tactics it uses, and the more ambiguity and room for harm it has, the more likely it is for Victor or Fadi or someone else's miracle story to change their life for the worse. I think you can interpret a miracle as divine intervention or good karma or some kind of sign from the universe if it gives you comfort, but you should also give it enough critical thought and don't trust it as much as actual evidence. This is also not an explicit condemnation of all religions. It is an invitation to put every influential belief system under rigorous inspection when we can. For they may be a harmless, valuable source of purpose and hope, or they may be a Trojan horse full of unpleasant surprises. What have you learned about my thoughts today? Do you have any conclusions? Share your thoughts in the live stream coming up next, or just watch it after the fact. Thank you for watching or listening. As always, think critically and think for yourself.